let me say uh, that uh, along with everybody else, uh, it, it is a real honor uh, to be part of this occasion today. Uh, so my thanks to the organizers for uh, the invitation to join uh, these two distinguished authors on stage. Uh, and I want to take this opportunity as well uh, to thank the Nashville Public Library as an institution. Uh, as many of you know, it is one of the real treasures of our city. Uh, from the incredible weekly puppet shows that my children all grew up on uh, to special gatherings like this one. So let me offer my congratulations to you both. Uh, together you have produced a veritable mountain of books. Uh, and I say this in the most literal sense. I had uh, those 17 books on my desk <laughs> uh, to prepare for today. Uh, and uh, not only could I not see over uh, that stack of books, but uh, you know, it seemed like the desk might collapse from the weight, <laughs> the literal weight and the, the, the weighty thoughts uh, inside those books. Um, so by my count, it is 17 books that you have authored uh, collectively. Uh, they're not just, uh, that's not just a lot of books. They are good books. They are meaningful books. They are books that tell us about the history uh, of the nation and many other things and of our own times in many ways. And I'm just going to reassure the audience that uh, as much as I'd love to, I'm not going to go through them one by one. Uh, <laughs> but I, what I want to do today, um, uh, besides congratulating these authors for this incredible accomplishment, uh, is to pull out some of the themes um, and challenges that attend the writing of history uh, and maybe particularly the writing of biography. Uh, so um, let me begin. Uh, in most of your books, uh, you've made the decision to focus on uh, an individual life as a way into history. Uh, now, this is not entirely true. Uh, the Wise Men is, of course, a collective biography. Uh, and uh, Walter, your uh, wonderful book, The Innovators, is really a story about uh, an assembly of uh, many different people um, in the creation of the computer and the internet, uh, a story I think that probably simply couldn't be told uh, as any one person's idea or effort. Um, so you look at hackers and geniuses and geeks, as you say in your subtitle, along with many others. Uh, but in the main, uh, your books have been centered on a single prominent figure, uh, so Steve Jobs, rather than the innovators. So in your view, and I want to ask you both uh, the question, uh, what are the payoffs of telling history through biography, through an individual person? It's a very good question, Sarah, and I know your work has been on collective type uh, history. And when Evan and I were in college, sort of the notion of biography had gone out of favor in the academy mm -hmm. because it was looked upon as taking a great person and trying to do that narrative threat. We both joined Time magazine, and Henry Luce had always said, tell the history of our mm -hmm. time through the people who make mm -hmm. it. And that's why Time would put a person on the cover. Uh, when we were in college, one of the professors there, Doris Kearns, uh, who was going for tenure at uh, the college, did not get tenure because mm -hmm. what she published was a biography, Lyndon Johnson, The American Dream. Yeah. So it caused biography to go out of favor in the academy, and it left it to people like the Reverend Mr. Meacham and myself and Evan and Doris <laughs> and <laughs> David McCullough and, you know, jo uh, Caro and others yes. who were non-academics mm -hmm. to fill the biography hole. But to get to the point of your question, we biographers know we have a dirty little secret that we distort history a little bit by making it seem like a gal or a guy goes up to a garret or a garage, has a light bulb moment, and history happens. And it's not always true that way. Having done Steve Jobs, I realized there was what he would call the reality distortion field. I made it look like Steve Jobs had revolutionized these interests. So almost as a corrective, I said, okay, I'm going to do a collective work on the people you haven't heard of because innovation is a team sport. It's a collaborative effort. As we do things, it's always good, and you have to remember when I mentioned Luce, he was accused of doing personality journalism. He said, well, we didn't invent that. The Bible did. That's the way you tell <laughs> stories. You begin with Adam and Eve, etc. So I think it's always a mix between the role an individual can play and the role the forces of history play. And the final thing I'll say is um, the Kissinger book I did, uh, I found something in the files that he had told a Time correspondent, which is when I was a professor, I used to think history was made by great forces. But now that I'm involved, he was doing the shuttle mission between Golda Meir and uh, Anwar Sadat, 
I see the difference individuals make. Yeah, that was Henry being non-humble. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I think we always have to get that balance. And uh, if we, we biographers should be careful. I'm doing one right now in which I'm trying to do square the circle by having both a central character mm. and a group of people around her. Terrific. Uh, can I ask you the same question, Evan? The, 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 what, maybe the question about what biography uniquely brings, uh, allows the reader to see or to uh, enter into. Well, history is made by human strength, but also human weakness. Mm. And uh, it's the combination that's so endlessly interesting to all of us, because we're all a mix of, of good and bad, and so are our leaders, just on a larger scale. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think of, uh, I wrote about Richard Nixon, who is a really poignant example of this. Uh, he was ultimately defeated and, and took the country to a bad place because of his personal insecurities. But those insecurities also made him wise and made him see things that others could not see. I'll give you one, one small example, which is so revealing to me about why he was a great politician. He was running for student body president at Whittier College back in the 1930s. Nobody liked Richard Nixon. <laughs> he used to stand on the steps and hand out pieces of gum to people to make them like him. <laughs> but Whittier College, he was looking for a platform to run on. The platform he ran on was bringing dancing to Whittier College. Mm -hmm. Now, what? Mm -hmm. Richard Nixon was a terrible dancer. Mm -hmm. He didn't like to dance. Mm -hmm. But he perceived something. Whittier was a very conservative school and uh, was against dancing. Now, the rich kids at Whittier could dance all they wanted because they could go to the local country club or they'd go out to nightclubs. It was the poor kids who couldn't dance. There were more poor kids than rich kids at Whittier College in 1932. He won in a landslide. Now, that was something he kept all his life. He had some of its resentment. He hated the elites. You know, he didn't like the New York Times and all. He hated Harvard. He once, he once heard that the president of Harvard was in the White House when he was there. Get him out! Get him out! <laughs> but he, uh, so that we can make fun of all that. But he also had a feel for the common man. Mm -hmm. he, he's the guy who originated the phrase, the silent majority. Mm -hmm. He was right about that. Mm -hmm. And you can distort this, and populism can get out of control, and it can go into dark mm -hmm. places. But he had a sensitivity mm -hmm. that there are ordinary people out there mm -hmm. who feel that they're not on the inside, mm -hmm. and, and, and he felt for them. And that was a, that was a great, that was leadership. Mm -hmm. And so that ability through a biography to tap into those weaknesses or insecurities of a figure that allow them to be the person, right. the leader, uh, in that case, uh, that they become. Um, wonderful. Well, I, I am not a biographer myself. I've always admired that uh, ability to really get into the head and into the emotions, uh, the turmoil of an individual person. Um, you both uh, do so well. Um, uh, and yet, uh, I, I'm also uh, someone who has been working and writing a lot recently about privacy. And so I can't resist uh, asking the two of you about the peeling away of the public persona, the uncovering of secrets uh, that is really a necessary part, I think, of the biographer's craft. Um, and I'm reminded here of the critic Janet Malcolm, uh, who called the biographer, and this is a quote, a professional burglar. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that before. Um, and she likens the uh, reading of biography to reading someone else's mail. Um, and I'm sure she meant that in the nicest way, but I, I do want to ask you, you know, what you, um, what you think about that process, uh, how you've uh, wrestled with it yourself um, in, um, in letting uh, readers see uh, the person that didn't always want to be seen. Uh, you yourselves write of the six wise men, for example, uh, that they were very private men uh, who didn't willingly reveal much of their uh, private lives, their intimate lives. Uh, they avoided publicity, unlike many of our uh, leaders today, um, but were comfortable with public power. Um, so let me, let me ask you the question, um, you know, is the biographer a trespasser, necessarily, of sorts? Uh, and is privacy the enemy of the biographer? Um, and, and I'll follow up with something else if that doesn't get you started. But, uh, but I I'd love to hear you <laughs> on that topic. Well, uh, Janet Malcolm, you mentioned, 
uh, did say that biographers are like burglars. She also said that journalists are like con men. <laughs> I don't know what she said about academics, well, <laughs> but I don't want to know. <laughs> Which, and I used to, I used to, I, I taught a class in journalism uh, in college, and and I and I would read a paragraph from Janet Malcolm to my students so they understood what they were getting into. Uh, that when you seek to write about somebody, mm -hmm. there is a kind of invasion of privacy, and you you sometimes. Uh, what she was referring to is journalists like to pretend that they're friends of their subjects. They're not friends, ultimately. Uh, they are they're getting in there and, and learning things that maybe the subject doesn't really want them to know. But, and here's the big but. This is hard to persuade. I, I had to persuade college seniors, or college juniors of this, but when you write about somebody, and if you just write about how great their resume is, and how terrific they are. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares, and it's not true. And everybody in their heart knows this. Everybody, every great book that you've ever read is full of conflict and struggle and vulnerability. And that when you, this is a little counterintuitive, the counterintuitive to kids who think that they only want to be written about ways that are good, they're saying, what do you mean? You want me to write about not the ways I'm good, but the ways I'm bad? Actually, yes, because it's more human and it's more real, and in the end, you'll look better. We, I think Walter and I both write very sympathetic biographies, mm -hmm. and yes, we do point out the flaws of the people that we write about, but it is to humanize them. We are writing about, by and large, great people, sometimes people with great flaws like Richard Nixon, but I wrote a sympathetic book about mm -hmm. Richard Nixon because he, he, he was human. I don't think you can really write honestly about people without writing about their flaws, and in the end, if you do that, if you succeed in doing that, you make them, you can make them, you can make them noble, you can ennoble them. Going beyond that is connecting the flaws to the greatness, as Evan did mm -hmm. with Nixon. Mm -hmm. When I was working on Steve Jobs, he's a deeply flawed, very mean at times, uh, distorting individual. And he said to me, I want you to do it warts and all. And by the end, when he was sick, he was telling me a whole lot of things that I had to consult with Kathy. Do I even put this in the book? Because he was so self-aware of his flaws and his things of his family, things he'd say about his friends. And he said, and I don't even want to read the book before it comes out, because if you write one of those authorized, whitewashed things, it's not going to get it all right. So the, at least in Evans Nixon book, to some extent in my Kissinger book, and very largely in Steve Jobs, the question is whether the imperfections, flaws, toughness, passion, craziness, mm -hmm. as Steve would have said, the people who are crazy enough to change the world are the ones who do, actually make it so that they can do things that a less flawed individual wouldn't. And that's the theme of a lot of our books, whether it's Kissinger, Nixon, Steve Jobs. That's right, uh, and that strikes me as true, uh, and a, a kind of guiding principle uh, for thinking about what you're doing with a life, right? You're not just exposing, you're using it to illuminate, right? Um, but I wonder if there is anything that you turned, um, that you came across uh, in the process of writing any of your books that, you re that really did give you pause about whether it should see the light of day, whether yeah, it should be published. I, I, there's a numerous, I'll let Evan speak too, but there are numerous times I want to make clear, at the end I leave something out. Yeah. And especially when it came to Steve Jobs, mm. you think, all right, he said this, he was in pain, he was on painkillers, he's mm -hmm. being really mean here. Mm. All right, that, and you have to balance. Now, this is a non-Janet Malcolm answer because early in one's career when one's a journalist, it's like, oh, you get something really amazing that's horrible and mean and terrible, but you're gonna throw it in because it's gonna help sales or yeah. when you peel it. I think as you get older, you balance. How important is it for the reader to know this and how painful will this be to people around the subject? And you know, you count on people like your, you know, wife or your friends and say, shall I leave that in or leave that out? Yeah, yeah, good. 
Uh, sometimes it's a matter of emphasis. Uh, what, uh, listening to Walter, I was thinking about one example I had. Uh, I wrote a book about some early founders of the CIA, and one of them was named Desmond Fitzgerald. And his daughter, Frankie Fitzgerald, is actually a famous writer. And as a courtesy to me, she gave me her father's letters. And the letters were, by and large, letters of a young man going off to war. And they were kind of callow and snobby. And I thought, this is great. I've got this guy's letters. You know, I can reveal him as a young man going off to war. And I, I, I put him in a draft of a manuscript. And I sent her the manuscript. Now, this raises another question of, do you show people what you're writing before you publish it? Generally, the journalist's rule is no. As a writer, I break that. As a journalist, I broke that rule all the time. And as a, as a biographer, I do it all the time. And what happened was interesting. She wrote me back. She was furious. And I kind of had hurt feelings that she hated it so much. And I, got to, I was defensive about it, but I realized she was right. Not that those letters weren't true, but they, they were distorted. They didn't really capture the, the, the essence of them. The balance was wrong. Yes, he was a callow young man. Yes, he was a snob, but he overcame those things. I didn't need to dwell on it. A little bit goes a long way. I did use some of it, but I didn't go on and on about it because she had helped recenter me about her own father. I didn't totally agree with her view of her father, and I didn't, the book doesn't represent that, but, but it helped me to filter it through another human being and seeing that I'd gotten the balance wrong. So it's not that you leave things out. A lot of it's just a question of proportion and how you balance it. Real quickly, to give a shout out to a really great biography you'll be honoring in a future year, George Packard does this beautifully oh, in his Holbrook biography. Does he ever? Um, and um, our man, and he has the letters just like, and, and, and Holbrook, of course, knew Desmond Fitzgerald, I assume, uh, and the family. Uh, but Frankie's in the book. Yeah. Frankie's in the book. But um, I just, and he's very, he does something that Evan and I don't do, but I'm going to try to learn to do next time is he talks to the reader directly. Right. He'll say something like, there's not much to be you know, learned in these grade school letters. We could wallow in them, and I'll tell you this, but let's get to Vietnam as soon as we can. <laughs> it's almost a conversation explaining right. to you yeah. why he's leaving things out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Letting the reader in a little bit to that process, yeah. too. Um, well, we've already been talking about this, but I really do um, want to talk to you both, get your thoughts on what it's like to um, it, it sort of entwine your life, I suppose, with the people that you write about. You were just talking about speaking to other family members and so forth. Um, but, but the act of writing a biography strikes me as just a very intimate act. It's an intimate engagement with another life. Um, uh, a life that you might admire, a life that you might uh, have uh, big questions about um, that you are, are digging uh, into. Um, and I, I, so I do want to ask you a little bit about how you've made the choices that you have uh, to write about certain figures. Um, and maybe this is a little like asking uh, you to choose among your children, but, but I did want to ask you, you know, who, who was your favorite, you know, uh, who was your favorite subject? Uh, not because maybe you liked them the best, but because they, they gripped you or you, they just interested you in a way that you couldn't uh, see uh, from, uh, you know, your initial forays into research. Well, you're right. It is like talk, picking, choosing among your children, because <laughs> generally, I, the last book I wrote is my favorite book. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> because it's done. <laughs> and also, there's a basic, you can't, you can't write a book unless, in a way, you fall in love with the subject. Mm. I, don't, I don't mean mm. idolize the subject, yeah. but get so engaged, and so it won't work. It won't happen mm. unless you get totally into it. So every book that I'm writing is the greatest book I ever wrote. <laughs> That must be nice. <laughs> the, um, How about you, Walter? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I always find it difficult, as much as I can admire Robert Caro, for example, to think of somebody who spends years after year, yeah. whether it be Robert Moses or Lyndon Johnson, with somebody they don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, that Evan and I can't do that. Uh, <laughs> And I, my progression of books often comes just, you know, one thing leads to another. Evan and I wrote The Wise Men, and it ends with Vietnam, which is when they're dubbed The Wise Men. And I wanted to continue through that, and so I did uh, Henry Kissinger, which picks up right when The Wise Men's last meeting occurs. 
And uh, after doing Henry Kissinger and dealing with a live subject who had many comments, I said, man, I'm going to do somebody who's been dead for 250 years next time. And so did Ben Franklin, also because Kissinger's balance of power, diplomacy, and realism was unusual for America, but Franklin did that as a diplomat. Um, I was surprised at Franklin's, the importance of science to him especially the electricity experiments. Mm -hmm. And we think of him as a doddering dude flying a kite in the rain. But, you know, that was a really important experiment that come into the checks and balances and all of his statecraft. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to demystify science and did Einstein. After I did Franklin and Einstein, I got a call from Steve Jobs. And he said, you yeah, know, do me next. I went, yeah, sure, you know, Franklin, Einstein, you. The obvious yeah, next it's step. obvious. But then I was told he had been diagnosed. And so I said, you know, yeah. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And as I said to you earlier, mm -hmm. after that, I wanted to do a collective biography, almost yeah. to make up for the singular thing. Uh, but to me, you want to be simple. You want to like it. And it all culminates for me with Leonardo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To get to your question, who would I like most mm -hmm. in a way? Because I noticed that, or Steve Jobs noticed, he said, everybody, I said, what do you want me to do? He said, everybody you write about combines the arts and sciences. Mm -hmm. They combine the humanities with technology, mm -hmm. and that's where creativity happens. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it, and he, I said, you know, we talked about it often. He said, the ultimate of that is Leonardo da Vinci. So I realized, okay, I got to do him. Yeah. <laughs> and he had been dead for 500 so years, is, which really. Though, right. So even though it may look to the, the outside reader that you've, you've plucked figures from very different periods, uh, different walks of life, different fields, that there is a logical kind of progression to how you've uh, I will you've admit I did figure. not know I had a logical theme until Steve Jobs <laughs> said, this is the theme of all your books. Ah, and then I said, yeah, that's a great you. theme. And great, great, great. <laughs> Well, is there anyone um, who, uh, when you, you began um, uh, reading, began thinking about taking up a new subject, is there anyone who uh, wound up being a very different kind of person uh, than you uh, had thought in the beginning? Someone who really surprised you, or someone who you warmed up to that you weren't expecting to, someone who disappointed you because they were a kind of figure that you had uh, put on a pedestal? I had a little bit that experience with Nixon, actually, because uh, I, I wrote about Richard Nixon because John Meacham asked me to. <laughs> really, literally. He was a, you know, why don't you do Nixon? Okay. Uh, I, I had sort of a thought that, well, counter-programming, Nixon hated people like me. He did. He hated East, I'm an East Coast, yeah. you know, Ivy League. Mm -hmm. That's, that, those are the kind of people he hated. I worked for the Washington Post right. Company. Right. He hated the Washington Post Company, and they hated him. You have ties to Harvard. Uh, <laughs> right, and he hated Harvard. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, but, but I, one thing I had not appreciated about Nixon was, because he's easy to caricature, and the caricature was true to some degree, mm -hmm. but there was a side of Nixon that wanted to be happier than he was. I was so, his daughter, Julie, uh, I read in an oral history once, it said that, you know, when, when, when Richard Nixon came home, he would turn on all the lights. He would put a show tune on. He would only want to talk about warm and friendly stuff at dinner. He wanted to be happy. Then he would go off to a study and get gloomy. But he wanted to be a happy person. He would write himself notes at night. I found in the Nixon Library, there are little notes he wrote to himself in the middle of the night about wanting to be joyful, about wanting to be inspiring, about wanting to be upbeat, all these things that he wasn't, but he wanted to be. And that made him a poignant figure to me, uh, and it made him more relatable. And, and yes, he did destroy himself, but there is, and what actually what destroyed himself, really, he wasn't self-aware. Nixon, as he was leaving office, said, if you hate your enemies, that will destroy you. Hello? <laughs> you know, did it really just occur to him? And, but it raises a, a larger point about mm. famous, powerful people. Sometimes they are blinkered. They need to be. Mm. They are different from you and me. They, they don't get up in the morning worrying about how they're getting along with their kids or where they left the car keys. They worry about saving the world and doing great things. Mm. And, and that blinkered quality, that lack of self-awareness, actually helped Nixon. Because mm. if he really looked at himself as this kind of insecure, clumsy, awkward guy who dropped things, he never would have 
he would have still be a lawyer in Whittier, you know? Uh, he needed to have that blindness to get ahead, and in the end, it destroyed him. Um, I'm realizing, notes to self, I guess, that uh, in my future lectures uh, on Nixon, that the chewing gum and the show tunes are going to have to be part of the portrait. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, let me ask a couple specific questions about uh, figures um, that you've taken up, some patterns that I notice uh, in uh, your uh, work, uh, respectively. So I want to ask you, uh, Evan, about first, um, that is this first. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. This is the uh, 2019 uh, book, the newest book uh, in your uh, in your collection. Um, it's out just this year. Um, and to me, um, you know, there's a few obvious ways in which it seems like a departure after the wise men, the man to see, the very best <laughs> men. <laughs> to think about some of the titles. There's uh, a certain pattern there. There's a pattern there. But you've broken it um, by writing about Sandra Day O'Connor. And this is, I think, a first for you, uh, first full-length study of a female subject. And I'm wondering if anything about that project uh, felt like new territory, different territory, or if it was just like writing another uh, biography of a public figure. It was new territory, and my wife also was deeply involved in it because in some ways she understood Sandra O'Connor better mm. than I did, uh, and we spent a lot of time talking about her. There were a little bit some counterintuitive things about uh, Justice O'Connor. She was actually tougher than the males that I've written mm -hmm. about because she had to be. Yeah. I mean, she's living in this man's world and kind of a difficult. I mean, you, can you imagine what it's like to be one of the very few women in the Arizona State Legislature right. in 1970? That's a rough place. Mm -hmm. Those guys are getting drunk and horsing around and, and doing stupid practical jokes. Mm -hmm. And she has to deal with all that. And she can't get all sorry for herself. You know, she ended up being the majority leader, the first woman ever to be the majority leader of a state senate. Mm -hmm. She didn't do that by... by by go Actually, she did go in the ladies' room and cry a few times. Mm -hmm. She did. She was human. She mm -hmm. cried. But she came out tough, mm -hmm. and she came out strong. Mm -hmm. And that was fascinating to try to figure mm -hmm. out how she did that. And, and, mm -hmm. and my, my wife, who had been in law school and worked in a law firm that was mm -hmm. full of men, she understood those pressures actually better than I did. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, well, I, I suppose, you know, in thinking about the 20th century and, of course, earlier times, the power brokers, the, the kind of movers and shakers, you know, naturally more of them uh, come uh, to us as uh, men. Um, but now, and certainly in 30 years' time, uh, you know, that won't be the case, uh, one would suspect. And so I'm curious if, for either of you, really, uh, you know, who are the women who we're going to be wanting biographies of? Uh, yeah, um, Walter. I'm actually writing a biography of a woman now. Can you tell uh, us who yeah, it sure. is? Or no? And it's uh, somewhat obscure. Mm -hmm. Some people in the room will have heard of her. Uh, she's Jennifer Doudna, and she's a professor at Berkeley, oh. who a biotech, a bio uh, microbiologist who invented CRISPR or co-invented it, the gene editing oh, technology that will allow your children to decide whether their children will be tall or short or blonde, you know, whatever, oh. and have be able to make edits in our genes that are inheritable and will change the human species. Mm. And so it's going to be the most important technology of the 21st century. Having written mm. about okay. physics through Einstein, which yeah. defines the first part of the 20th century, then information technology through the innovators and jobs mm. that do the same, biotech will do it. The interesting okay. thing about her is that being a woman does change her trajectory some. This century of biotechnology begins with the sequencing of the human genes, mm -hmm. genome, uh, the Human Genome Project at the turn of the century, <laughs> 2000. But it was an alpha male thing. It was Eric Lander, Francis mm -hmm. Collins, um, Craig Ventner, all these men, and the women were left out of it. So there are three women in this story, Jennifer being mm -hmm. the primary one, but Emmanuel Charpentier, who was the partner that she did this with from Paris, and Julian Banfield, mm -hmm. who focus on RNA. RNA is a less known sibling of DNA, mm -hmm. but it actually does the work. It's, DNA just sits there in the nucleus. Doesn't Something do a darn symbolic thing. there. But the RNA goes in, gets a code, goes, yeah. It's exactly. You put your finger on it, and it's the one that goes in, gets a code, goes to the manufacturing plant of the cell, makes the proteins, does the thing. So as they focus on RNA, they make this huge discovery, which is, I get it, we can edit the DNA. I won't go there in terms of the war of the genders, but... Um, <laughs> 
So they invent, especially Jennifer, what's called CRISPR, which mm -hmm. allows this to happen. I also think it's important for those of us in a room like this that celebrates history and the humanities mm -hmm. to realize how beautiful science, it is, mm -hmm. science is, and to the extent that you say women have been written out of some of history, which is, of course, true. But think of the fact of how much they've been written out of science, science and yeah. technology. Mm -hmm. I did Ada Lovelace as sort of the framing device for the innovators, a great woman who in the 1830s comes up with the concept of a general purpose computer. But I think it's important now because Jennifer Doudna, when she was in middle school, her dad puts a book on her bed, and it's The Double Helix by James Watson, mm -hmm. a very sexist book about how Watson and Crick mm -hmm. discover the structure of DNA mm -hmm. and sort of mess up Rosalind Franklin, yeah. whose photograph they look at, but she doesn't get mm -hmm. the credit for it. And Jennifer Doudna, A, becomes fascinated by science, mm -hmm. B, is told by her high school counselor, girls don't do science, mm -hmm. and three, she likes Rosalind Franklin. Uh -huh. So she figures out <laughs> discovering the yeah. structure of molecules will tell you the secret of life. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonderful tale and it involves yeah gender and science. Yeah, and I can't re wait uh, to read that book. Well, uh, Ada Lovelace is yeah. one of my daughter's heroes. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> I know that feeling too. Um, I, and let me ask, you've already touched on this, Walter, but, um, but I sense, I detect, and you've already said a little bit about the kind of logical progression, but a move from the political to the scientific, to the creative arts, to um, the figures who really cross the scientific artistic divide. And was that, again, a, a sense of sort of where the, a trajectory in history, that is, that the people who used to have uh, the kind of the most impact were the public figures, the, yeah, the politicians? Yeah, I realized at a certain point that Steve Jobs had far more impact on our lives mm -hmm. than, with all due respect to Linda Peake, who's sitting here, you know, Jimmy Carter or somebody who uh, mm -hmm. came to them. And he transforms industries. He transforms our industry of publishing. He transforms the music yeah. industry totally, as Nashville knows quite well. Yeah. The retail stores, personal computers, mm -hmm. phones, mm -hmm. everything else. And yet, we tend to write about political leaders more so. Yep. So I think that when I was at Time Magazine, we'd always pick a person of the year, et cetera. And it always tended to be, you know, the Secretary of State or mm -hmm. Gorbachev mm -hmm. or somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you realize we never picked Philo Farnsworth, who invented the television. And so when I came into Time, mm -hmm. I started doing people like Andy Grove, who made the microchip. And people mm -hmm. say, why is he person of the year? Mm. And I'd say, because the microchip is actually going to have more impact than Paul Volcker, who would be the runner-up. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I do try to show people connect science uh -huh. and technology uh -huh. to the humanity. Uh -huh. Let me ask you both. Uh, I'm just uh, so curious about this process by which you become uh, yeah, attracted to your subjects. Um, are there figures out there um, who have really intrigued you, but for whatever reason uh, you deliberately decided not to write about, that you put aside and just felt, I don't know, I, either that you couldn't do them yeah. justice or that you weren't the right biographer for the subject? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'm sorry, yeah, we're yeah, going to let yeah, Evan talk more, talking. but I have one that I no, just, you have a good one. I spent two years doing, I wanted to do a biography on Louis Armstrong. I grew up in the part of New Orleans near where he grew yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I knew people who played with him. I actually saw him a couple of times before he died in the 70s. And to me, he was everything. He was bringing together all the strands of creativity that come from the diversity of having, you know, marching bands and spiritual churches and French opera houses. And he brings it and he creates something huge, which is jazz. And at a certain point, I'd studied him from two years, gone to Corona, Queens, where all his parents. I knew everything there was to know about Louis Armstrong, except for who he was. Oh. I didn't know whether he was happy or not. I didn't know why he was smiling. I didn't know if he liked white people or not. Mm. I had to put it aside because I couldn't crack the code. Mm. Mm. I, I, I'm going to talk about a little prospective. I'm, I'm working on mm -hmm. a book now. My wife and I are working on a book now about uh, the end of World War II. Uh, dropping the atomic bomb on mm -hmm. Japan and the surrender of Japan. Mm -hmm. And often when you look at a subject, you're looking through a lot of refracted lenses and yes. there are a lot of holes. There are just paper that doesn't exist. The emperor of Japan, let's start with him. Mm -hmm. 
It was in our interests, and in Japan's interests after World War II, to make him a benign figure, a kind of peaceful guy who was a marine biologist who really had nothing to do with World War II <laughs> because we needed to have an <laughs> emperor of Japan yeah. to help for the peace mm. that the, the Japanese people could look to and revere and venerate and to help us with the transition. Was that really the emperor of Japan? Well, along came a, a, a lot of leftist scholars who decided actually, no, 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 he's a war criminal. He was actually in the inner councils, uh, orchestrating Pearl Harbor. Uh, he was aware of atrocities. He was aware of uh, brutalization of China, all this. And he was a terrible guy. Well, which was he, the meek marine biologist or the war criminal? The answer, I'm sure, is somewhere in between. But where in between? Now, to do that, I'm going to have to go to Japan, and I'm going to have to find people. Now, this problem is further complicated because the record has either been destroyed in many cases. They literally mm -hmm. were burning as the Americans were arriving in 1945. They were burning records, and records that are still locked up in the Imperial Palace that you can't get at. All of this raises the degree of difficulty, mm -hmm. and I'm going to have to do it obliquely through mm -hmm. diaries and memoirs mm -hmm. that people were around them. This also has a set of problems because what they wrote in their diary at one point, some of them changed their diaries to make them look less culpable because they knew they were facing war crimes. Ah, wow. So uh, yeah. there are a myriad yeah, many layers. Uh, layers there. Uh, now, and I'm not 100% sure I'm going to get through them. This is a, I'm writing, I'm talking about this something, pros I haven't written this book. Yes. Well, I got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. I'm not absolutely sure I'm going to get from here to there, but it's so fascinating that I want to try. Wonderful. Um, thanks for those answers. It's just so fascinating to hear about the, the process. Um, and let me, because I know our time is uh, beginning to run short, ask you one last question. It is about writing, but it's about writing together. Um, Walter, uh, you note uh, in The Innovators how crucial collaborative creativity uh, was to the tech revolution. Um, and indeed, uh, it's the strength of your collaboration, really, that the library is, for the first time, honoring not one, but two authors uh, this year. So uh, let me pry a bit uh, into that working relationship. Um, and I guess here I get to be the professional burglar. Um, <laughs> What, how did you come to write together? Um, and, and I want to ask a further question, which is, you know, what do you admire about the other as a writer? And what did you learn uh, from the other in um, writing uh, together? Well, I know that The Wise Men was not my idea. <laughs> I'm not sure whose idea it was exactly. Walter's or maybe Alice May. The good thing about Alice collaboration is you never know, with all due respect to your local resident, Al Gore, who invented it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I do know that one of the most exciting weekends, this shows you what a dweeb I am, one of the most exciting weekends I ever had was holed up with Walter, <laughs> typing away, trying to figure out what the book was about. Mm. And Walter's a night person. He would stay up all night. And mm. I would get up. It was sort of like a 24-hour news service. We just kept it going <laughs> the whole time. We're passing and the I, time. I don't remember. Yeah. I think it was like four days Wonderful. or something. And we had a bunch of books. And we were trying to figure out, well, who were the wise men? Yeah. I mean, we had to pick six. Yeah. And kind of yeah. what's the story? Mm. It was thrilling. Oh. It was just like the most exciting weekend I've ever spent. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, was just, it was just this amazing creative mm. process. We didn't really know. where We had a general, a general vague idea that there was a group of statesmen in World War II and after who had helped create the American century. We had a general notion, but who were they? And how could you make their stories t tie together? Uh, yeah. Well, I'll just add, uh, to bring in John Meacham, who brought us here. There was a wonderful period in the 80s and 90s when news magazines were in their heyday. Evan and I and John yeah. were part of that. And it was a very collaborative process. Mm. You had to work together. When we started, you didn't even have bylines. There'd be correspondents and reporters and writers and editors. Mm. And crafting a great story was a team sport. Mm. We got away from that. When I say we, I mean the world, America, whatever. When suddenly, you know, people wanted to be on TV, they wanted their own brand names, et cetera, et cetera. But I look upon that as my favorite part of my life except for the day Evan said, I'm going to leave time to go to Newsweek, <laughs> when we were all sitting there working at these news magazines, comparing notes on Saturday night when we had each finished our news magazine. 
and realizing the joy that mm -hmm. comes not from your own name being out there, mm -hmm. but from collaboration. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, let me uh, turn now uh, to questions from the audience. Um, I, there were a host of them that were collected um, in the, uh, I guess, before we began talking. Um, and uh, I've got them here, uh, and I'm going to get through a few of them, maybe not all of them, so apologies to those of you who won't get your question answered. Uh, but let me begin with one uh, that is to the two of you. Uh, and it asks uh, you to please comment on the quality of advice from wise men uh, to LBJ, to Lyndon Johnson, uh, during the Vietnam buildup. Um, what can you say about the quality of that advice, of those six figures you spent so much time with? Uh, the advice is poor. Uh, this is the, the problem with wise men. Mm. You know, we, we venerate the idea that there are old wise men who come in, but actually, in history, often what happens is that the elder statesmen are out of it. They mm. don't know. They're, mm. they're not really plugged in. They really don't know, and they're being driven by their old passions, which are hardening. Mm. So Dean Acheson, who was a very great Secretary of State, who helped create the Western Alliance and the Marshall Plan mm -hmm. and save Europe after World War II and really was truly maybe our greatest Secretary mm -hmm. of State. Mm -hmm. By the time he was an old guy coming in to advise, he was kind of a bitter, hard guy who said, yeah, mm -hmm. let's stick it to him in Vietnam mm -hmm. and gave LBJ the wrong advice. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a happy ending to this story, a quasi-happy ending, because the wise men came together in 1968 and reversed themselves and told the President, hey, enough. Uh, we got to get out. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a more mixed picture. Mm -hmm. But their initial advice was bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything further on that, Walter? Or? One of the themes that Evan did so well, especially in his, he did a lot of the second half of the book, is Harriman tutoring Atchison. And the question is, why was mm -hmm. Harriman's mind more flexible than Atchison? Huh. They were grotten together, they were, uh -huh. you know, yep. yelled together. And they knew each other, you know, even from rowing together. I think the, pic the book begins with a picture of them in a sco I mean, at a rowing dock in uh, yeah. Groton. Um, and Steve Jobs used to talk about this a lot, which is after the age of 30, your mind gets into a groove. Mm. How do you make sure it doesn't stay in it? Mm. And so I think that's mm. the mm -hmm. good part Evan mm -hmm. wrote, which is mm -hmm. how does Harriman get Atchison out of his groove. Mm -hmm. Really that interesting. Yeah. 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 And uh, actually, one interesting thing about that, Har Atchison was smarter than Harriman. But oh, Harriman, yeah. Harriman yeah. managed to be yeah. open minded. Yeah. Intelligence yeah. comes in lots of different. That's right. Forms. And that's why we call it the yeah. wise man, but for many reasons, one of which yeah. is. Uh, but, but it ain't about intelligence. Atchison was the smartest of them. Hmm. But this wasn't about smarts. The mm -hmm. best and the brightest, as Albert Stam said, is what yeah. got us into this mess. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it took wise people, not smart people. That's right. OK, yeah, really important distinction. Um, let me ask another of the questions from the audience. And this is uh, to you specifically, Walter. Um, and it's to name one memorable moment uh, from your interview with Steve Jobs. I'm sure there were many, but just pick one. <laughs> yeah. Um, very late in the game, when he, he had a reality distortion field, he thought he was going to keep outrunning the cancer and mm -hmm. new, new treatments were mm -hmm. going to happen. But in 2011, in the summer, it was clear that he might not make it. Mm -hmm. We were sitting in the garden of his place uh, in Palo Alto in the backyard. And I said to him, uh, what was it all about? What, what, what do you think the legacy was? And he said, part of the theme of the book is the guru in India who has taught him to be Zen and everything else. Mm -hmm. He said, my guru taught me that life is like a river and that history is a river. Mm -hmm. And if you're very lucky, you come at a time where you get to take wonderful things out of this river. You get to take products people had made, ideas they put into the river. And I've been very lucky because of all the things that being born now in Silicon Valley, whatever, I got to take out of the river. Mm -hmm. But what I realize now is it's not how much you get to take out of the river, it's what you got to put into the river that matters. Mm -hmm. And he cried easily, and he started mm -hmm. crying. I'm mm -hmm. tearing up, too. Mm -hmm. But I realize that it's going to happen to all of us, as he said. We're going to 
Think of all the successes we have, and then we're going to say, okay, mm. but what is my significance? Mm. A wise man, really, uh, a moment where you saw his wisdom, I suppose. Um, this is a different kind of question. Uh, it's about writing and kind of the craft of writing, I guess. But when do you know, this is a question to you both, uh, when something you're working on is ready to be published? <laughs> It's not uh, an obvious uh, answer to that, I think. Uh, right. When my wife tells me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd give the one word answer we share, which is Binky, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> we, have an, we share an agent whose nickname is Binky, Amanda mm. Urban. Uh, so someone else tells you, you can't see it yourself, maybe. Is it when you're just, you figured out all the angles or you feel like you can't do one more revision? What is it that convinces you that the work is done? Both, I mean, I'll, I'll answer slightly off the point, which is both of us write narrative. Mm -hmm. As you know as an academic and you know mm -hmm. from your work, sometimes narrative is not considered the best way to do things. It leaves things out. But you're creating a story. Yeah. Yeah. You're creating a story that has a very clear beginning. Mm -hmm. It progresses and everybody grows. Things <laughs> happen to them. And then it has an end. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people who write don't do that. John Meacham does it well, Evan does, which is, you know what the tale is. It's an odyssey, mm -hmm. and in the end, people mm -hmm. are going to have a journey, they're going to grow, and they're going to die. And a lot of books, I mean, I remember reading, trying to read Einstein biographies, they just don't, you know, people are writing these books that didn't tell you, doesn't start with him being born or end with him dying. Mm -hmm. And I think that narrative... <laughs> which is sometimes out of favor among academics. Narrative is just a beautiful way. And you know when it's over, because, you know, it's the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. I guess when it's over is a different question than when it's done, but I, but I take the point. No, but that's why I took it a slight yeah. angle, but I think yeah, yeah. sometimes people always put in layers on whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, Leonardo da Vinci's born, and at the very end with the Mona Lisa next to him, he's mm -hmm. still putting a few brush strokes. He doesn't know if it's finished yet, mm -hmm. a few more brush strokes. Mm -hmm. But then, as he puts it on the last line of his notebook, but the soup is getting cold. And he meant <laughs> about lunch, but he also knew this is the end. <laughs> yeah, that's a, lovely, that's a lovely line. Anything that you wanted to add? Uh, this is more processy, but mm. uh, actually, mm -hmm. sometimes when you think you're done, you're not done. Mm -hmm. Because you need another round, and you need another round, and you need more editing. And you, I mean, a lot of uh, some uh, writers think, I don't need editors. Nonsense. Everybody needs editors. Uh, I got, I got I, my, my wife for sure, but I have uh, others as well. <laughs> yeah. And you need them mm -hmm. because it's a long process. And, it, and you know what? It gets better if you mm -hmm. keep working on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me give an offbeat thought that I've been yeah. working on has never happened, which is books are approximately 550 years old, let's say, since invention of movable type. And they're set in type, and you put them out in the world, and they're done. And maybe you revise them, and mm -hmm. there's third or fourth. Mm -hmm. But basically, it's it. I thought 20 years ago that there would be a form of narrative book it would be wiki-like, meaning it would constantly be updated, like a Wikipedia mm. industry, but curated yeah, by yeah. the author. Because I think that would be an interesting form of book, where you, especially like the innovators, where mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. would continue. And I'm surprised that uh, invention hasn't happened. I suppose other forms of writing are doing that all the time, right? The blog or that, right? The constant uh, updated life, but not, but not books. I mean, it's interesting how resistant they are to newfangled, uh, you know, inventions. They are their own, um, you know, they are they're a pretty good form, pretty good format, I suppose. Uh, maybe they don't need a, maybe they don't need innovation. Um, do I have time for a couple more? One more question. Is that what I'm saying? One more question. Okay. Well, I'm gonna apol with apologies again to those I didn't get to. I'm going to ask the question, which is the question, in a way, the theme of this weekend, uh, which is, how does history inform the future? Um, it's a question from the audience. It's the question of this weekend. But it's a question, I guess, about the relationship you see uh, through your writing between past and present. Uh, you know, looking across your whole uh, career of writing, um, are there things, uh, I suppose, that stand out uh, that help us understand uh, where we've been and where we're going? Well, one thing for sure, if you're writing about America, is its resiliency. 
Mm. Somebody named John Meacham wrote a book about this called Don't Soul of America. <laughs> it's a great book. You should buy it because it will make you feel better. And it will make you feel better because it's the truth. Yeah. Again and again, we've dug ourselves into a hole in this country. And, we've, and people have come along, men and women have come along to get us out of that hole. And some of them were pretty common, like Harry Truman, you know, nobody thought he was going to be mm -hmm. so great, That's but, right. you know, he was. Abraham Lincoln was a pretty obscure figure, uh, but he, you know, and we've been a terrible, the Civil War was a terrible time. Mm -hmm. Not just the Civil War, but as John has written, the McCarthy era, when this crazy senator was going around uh, on these witch hunts. Uh, that was really, that went on for years. That was a serious problem. There's a photograph that uh, John has in his book that is just so striking. It's a parade up Pennsylvania Avenue of 20,000 Ku Klux Klansmen in their robes going up Pennsylvania Avenue yeah. at a time that I think, mm -hmm. how, many, how many U.S. governors, six or seven, were members of the Klan? Mm -hmm. And then this is the 1920s. It was a terrible time. We forget. But things get better. They get better. The, we have this unbelievably resilient instrument called the United States Constitution mm -hmm. to which we go again and again, reinterpreting it, reshaping it, finding ways to keep this fantastic American experiment going. And it can look pretty dark, but you know, the arc of history, I mean, Walter and I are optimists about this, the arc of history mm -hmm. is up. I'm in. Walter. Okay, <laughs> final word. <laughs> Wonderful.